Wow. We are in a series called Behind the Curtain, and I'll describe it to you if you haven't been a part of it in just a moment. But first, would you help me in welcoming those that are in our South location streaming in and those that are online? We love you so much. One church, many different spots that you might be streaming in. So we're in this series called Behind the Curtain. And if you haven't been a part of the series, I'll catch you up to speed kind of Uh, quickly in the series. What we've decided is that the enemy, like the scripture says, is out to destroy. So what we wanted to do is take you behind the curtain and show you some of his deceptions so that you wouldn't be deceived. That's what the whole series is about. And I love this statement that Pastor Tracy's been using during this series so far. It says, Satan deceives to gain agreement by appealing to the senses in order to control. Satan deceives to gain agreement because he needs agreement so that he can step in by appealing to the senses in order to control. So we're gonna go behind the curtain and expose some of his tactics today as we have been doing in this series. But before we do that, let's do this declaration. Let's say this all together to get our minds and our hearts ready to receive from the Lord. Repeat this after me. Today, I will hear the voice of God. Through the word of God, my eyes will be enlightened and I will be changed. Now look at somebody and tell them, I will be changed. That, that kind of seals it into your heart. Today's your day. You're going to be changed. All right. Hey, have you, ever, have you ever made a decision in the moment that you regretted later? Nobody? All of us, right? Like, I remember I was just looking online and I saw this Costco ad continue to show up, or it was in the news or something, and it continued to roll by, and I was triggered to click on it to see what was going on. It was called The Gold Rush. Has anyone seen that article in the last couple of weeks? Yeah. It was at Costco, and I thought The Gold Rush was a long time ago, but there's a new gold rush in town. It's called Gold Bars for Sale at Costco, okay? And people were losing their minds. It was selling out all over online. There's no way that you could find it. Trust me, I tried. Uh, So like they, they were ordering these things so fast, as soon as they would fill the shelves, people were in lines to grab them off the shelves. They were triggered into this idea like, I gotta get that, that gold bar from Costco. And then I did a little bit more research on it, and I thought, I wonder if anyone stopped in the emotion of the moment and said, what's the cost of that gold bar, and what's the value of that gold bar? Yeah? So I did a little research on an ounce of gold, and what I found out is they were selling at the the crazy awesome price of two grand at Costco. But what I found out is they were only worth like just over $1,800. And I thought to myself, you people got tricked. You folks got tricked. And I was digging around and almost got tricked probably at the same time. I remember there was uh, back in around 2003, I was living in Japan and what I would call the real estate market at that moment, a gold rush. Like it was buy, buy, buy. You got to buy it before somebody else gets it. And I fell into the trap and I bought some real estate before I came back to the States because I didn't want it to all get bought up. Have you ever been in that spot? And, and I, got, I got tricked into it because what I found out is when I moved back in 2003, around 2005, there was this little thing called the Great Recession that happened. And it took me like 10 years to get that thing from being underwater so that I could relieve myself of that condo that I bought at the moment. Has anyone ever been in that spot, like triggered by the ads, triggered by the emotion of a moment, and then you make a mistake because there's so much energy in that moment? I think we all can agree to that. I've I've titled today, and what I'd like to kind of discuss is, is this phrase, triggered to trust, triggered to trust. Would you, would you look at somebody and say it just so it locks in for you? Triggered to trust. Triggered to trust. Because I feel like our eyes lead us or our emotions lead us 
much of the time, and much of the time it's leading us to danger without us even knowing. I think it's actually a deception of the enemy. If he knows this about us, which he does, then he uses these triggers to make us trust in a worldly system rather than a godly system. Watch this in 1 John 2. It says, For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. So I want to I focus right here on this underline, the lust of the eyes today. That's what the whole message is going to be out. I'm, I'm defining it as triggers to trust, like how the enemy triggers us to trust in his system, and a lot of times he does it through the eye gate. A lot of times he does it through our emotions, through our senses. But what, what you may be thinking as soon as this word shows up, lust, you may be thinking that we're going to talk about something that you have to get your kids out of the auditorium for right now. This, this is not where we're going. That uncomfortable topic is for the relationship series. That's probably going to land in February. So today I'm not going to talk about that uncomfortable topic. I'm going to talk about a completely different uncomfortable to- topic, okay? Is that fair? Can we do that? All right, so let me define these triggers, and then, and then I'll even simplify it from here a little bit, just so we're all on the same page. Here's, here's what I think the three triggers are to the lust of the eye. Number one is greed, and the definition of greed for today is selfish desire for wealth or power. Selfish desire for wealth or power. Number two, unbelief. Here's the definition, faith in anything other than God. Unbelief isn't necessarily no belief, it's just a belief in anything other than God. So that would be unbelief in God or his ways or his systems. Number three is fear, to be afraid of something that appears, remember your senses tell you that you should be afraid of it, that appears dangerous. Those, so those are our definitions of the triggers that the enemy tries to trigger us to trust more than God. Let me even get more specific with you. Uh, greed. Here's, here's what it might look like. It might look like this. I want what I see immediately. I just want what I see. As soon as I see it, I know that's for me, and I want it. And I don't pause to think about it. I don't, like my dad used to say, this is one that you need to sleep on. I don't do that. I just go for it because it's called greed. I want what I see. Number two is unbelief. I believe what I see. And if you were to look at the scriptures, that would be the opposite sometimes of what God wants us to do, to do because he wants us to believe what we don't see so that it can be seen. Yeah? So I believe what I see. And the third one, fear. I fear what I see. I fear what I see. So this is what we're going to kind of dig up today because I feel like they, they trigger us to trust in the worldly system rather than God system. Watch this in James. It says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. What James is trying to do is to help us stay out of this worldly system and over here in this godly system. And he describes it as desires that conceive sin in our life, right? Desires conceive. So what is he saying? He's saying worldly desires impregnate us to birth worldly outcomes. Now, why is that so dangerous? Worldly desires to worldly outcomes are are so dangerous because they're influenced by the enemy. Anything on this earth can be influenced by the enemy. Do you agree with me so far? Anything on this earth can be influenced by the enemy. Now, you don't have to be afraid of that because we have the greater power that lives inside of us that we can introduce at any moment. Let me give you an example of how this works. Um, Let's take Google. And no, I'm not calling Google the devil. You may have your own opinion on that. But here's how Google works, right? And you guys have all kind of figured this out. Like, Google studies you to understand what you desire what your behavior is, where you go online, and then what do they do? They track everything that you do so that they can collect the data to put things in front of your eyes because as soon as they can get them in front of your eyes enough, you'll trust and you'll click on it. Is that true? Well, if we think that Google's so smart in collecting data, we we might want to figure out that the enemy is smarter than Google. 
because the enemy is tracking your behaviors and tracking your desires and putting things in front of your eyes because he wants you to falter in your way. He wants you to trip up. He wants to trigger you to trust him rather than God. This is his purpose. This is his plan. He's trying to trip you up in your life. So the enemy, the enemy triggers us to trust something that can hurt us. We don't know it because our emotions are in the way, our senses are in the way, but in the moment we don't know it, but in the end we figure it out that he tripped us up because he triggered us to trust him rather than God. He plants it, and by way of scripture it says conceived, so he's planting something that will grow and take us further off track. This is why it's so important. So let's, let's talk about that first trigger that, that we're going to examine today, greed, greed. So I want to I want to look at where it originated in scripture. We'll have to go all the way back to the book of Genesis to see where it originated. I'll set up the storyline just in case you're not familiar with the book of Genesis. A lot of you are. Here's what happens. God creates a garden. He puts a man in it, he puts a woman in it. He creates all of this and then he says there's one tree. Out of all the trees, there's one that I don't want you to eat from. And guess what they do? Yeah, because you know you, you know what they do, right? So he says, there's only one tree that I don't want you to eat from. But then the serpent shows up, and the serpent is guided by the enemy. He's, a, he's, a, he, he, he's what the enemy looks like in this scenario. He comes in, and he starts talking to Eve. And here's, here's what he says to Eve, because this is where greed shows up for the very first time in the Scriptures. God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Now, you might be thinking, well, then why would God put a tree in the garden that was the most desirable and the best for food to eat, and then that would trigger them to trust in the enemy? Did, like, why would God do that? And I want to show you that it wasn't that that drew them to this tree. Because in Genesis 2.9, before this, it says, And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. So every tree in the garden was just as pleasant for sight and just as good for food, but there was something else that mankind wanted. And here's what the enemy does to trick them at that moment and us at this moment in our lives. He triggers us to trust that we want control. Here, here's a couple of triggers that show up in this scripture. We want full control. This is called greed. This keeps God out. This allows the enemy in because I want full control. God, I got this one handled. And the next one is this. We want to be the God of our life. Now you might be thinking, he must be talking to somebody else because that's not me. Let's just look at the scriptures today and see if anything pops out at us that may have us, because we're not here today to say, oh, my goodness, you're in such trouble, uh, there's no way out for you. No, 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 we're going to end this message on such a high note, because God's always made a way out for his people. But what we'd like to do, what we'd like to do, if the enemy is in any area of our life, we'd like to boot him out, because that's deception, and we'd like to walk in the godly system that God created for our life. Is that true? So that's what we're going to try to do. So don't be offended by me. I'm just going to read some scriptures, and we're going to talk about them today, okay? The uncomfortable topic. Here we go. The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. What is this saying? This is saying the first of the first. So anything that I receive I'm supposed to be able to honor God with it. And why is that the case? Because if I honor God with the first of the first, anything that I get, my original intention in anything that I get is to put it under God's control again. That could mean resources. That could mean finances. We just did a child dedication. You know what that means? I just received, so I want to get this under God's control. I want to get my child under God's control. I want to get my finances under God's control. I want to get my resources under God's control. In Matthew 23, over in the New Testament, Jesus actually speaks to this point. 
He says, you ought to do these things like justice and mercy, but he also says, but you ought not forget to tithe. Why am I talking about the tithe? Because I feel like so many people uh, want God in their finances, but they eliminate this fact that to get him in their finances, this is an obedience thing. This is an obedience play that we can get under his finances with anything that we get, we first honor God with. This is what the scripture is trying to show us. Let me, let me show you even a more kind of scary scripture, Malachi 3, 8 through 9. It says, will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? His answer, in tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. This is God speaking to his people. What is he trying to tell us here? He's trying to tell us that any anytime that we don't, when we receive, anytime that we don't give first, we're robbing God. He's actually saying that this isn't even yours to start with. Yes, it might be in your possession, but it's not yours to start with. It's mine first. If you want my protection over your life, then you're going to have to honor me to get your finances under my domain and my protection and my control so that I can cover the rest. This is what God's trying to say. No smiles in the room? So what we'd be saying if we don't, I'd rather take care of this myself. This is better in my hands than yours. Still no smiles? Like, this, this is what we would be saying anytime that we receive something and don't honor God with it. We would be saying, God, I got this. You hang out over there. This is probably going to be better under my management. (laughs) Yeah. So some people think that this tithe went away with the law because you look in the New Testament and it says Jesus fulfilled the law. And I would say that's very convenient. But I wouldn't agree with it. Because here's what happened with the tithe. The tithe, the tenth, actually happened prior to the law. You can look up Abraham. You can look up Melchizedek. You can look up uh, Cain and Abel. You can look up any of these. And there was a practice prior to the law. Then the law comes along. There was also a practice prior to the law that was called thou shalt not kill prior to the law because it wasn't good then. Remember when God got offended with Cain because he killed his brother? It still wasn't a good move back then. Then thou shalt not kill and the tithe was included in the law. Then Jesus came to fulfill the law, but there were some principles that still stayed in place because it's still not a good idea to kill somebody. And it's still not a good idea that you're a better manager than God over your finances. It's just the case. I would rather have God involved, yeah? So tithing is mentioned eight times in the, in the New Testament as well, because a lot of people would like to go, no, 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 the New Testament's all about the offering. And if we were to go that route, we would have to say offering means over and above the tithe. So you're getting yourself into a slippery slope because now we're going over the 10%. That's what the New Testament is more about than even the tithe, because that's a given. That was prior to the law, through the law, and after the law. Here's what tithing does. Tithing breaks the worldly desire called greed. And that's what God wants to do. He wants to break greed off of our life. Another scripture on this, 1 Timothy 6 says this. It says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Not money itself, but the love of it is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. He doesn't even call out the enemy in this scripture. He says, if money has your heart, then you're actually piercing yourself. You're actually hurting yourself because you're falling in to the enemy's trigger to trust him more than God. That's what he's saying here. This is pretty important for us than I would think. Greed, greed eats up the wealth that God desires to get to you because it isn't under his protection. It isn't under his control. One more scripture, and then I'll give you a couple of examples. Malachi 3.10, it says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse, which we would define as the church, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. I love that scripture. Because as soon as you, through obedience, get your finances under God's control, he rebukes the devourer from your finances. That's what happens. So some people will come into the church or, or reach out to me to pray over their finances when they run into a hiccup in their finances. And that, that's great. But they may ask me, like, uh, 
I got this problem in my finances. Pastor James, would you pray over this? And sometimes I ask them before we even pray, I'll say, like, are you a tither? And they look at me cross-eyed like, why is that a part of this conversation? Because I got to know where we're at and how we can pray. Because the scripture doesn't say pray and rebuke the devourer. It doesn't say prayer is the answer. It says obedience is the answer. Now, I can pray, but I'd rather take that scripture and I'd rather agree with scripture. Hey, if you're a tither, you have tither's rights. The enemy cannot go into your finances because that's what the word of God says. So now he's already rebuked, and now we come in agreement with that scripture, and we send him packing. Amen? Amen. That's what we do in prayer. But it's, it's a little bit awkward because I want to pray that prayer, but if you're not a tither, I can't pray that prayer. It's kind of like this. If it's already God's. If I were to loan you my truck, which don't get any ideas, it ain't going to happen. But if I were, if I were to throw you my keys and say, yeah, yeah, you can take the truck for the day, yeah, remember, don't ask me in the lobby. It ain't happening. But if I were to do that and you were to come back later on that day and you were to say, hey, Pastor James, I'm going to give you this truck, I'd be like, you're going to what? You're going to give me something that's already mine? Like, I got the police on the phone and uh, you better just hand over those keys because I already own it. This is kind of like the tithe. When you go, God, I think today I'm going to be really generous and I'm going to give you the tithe. He's like, those are my keys, man. <laughs> like, I got the police on the phone and uh, hand over those keys. You see, it's kind of strange how we operate because the scripture is very clear that that's already his and that's how protection comes over our life. And I, I feel like it's a trick of the enemy or a trigger to get us to trust his system so that he can have control over our finances. You can make as much money as you want to make, but if you love it, if, if you can't get it under God's protection, it's all in danger, not just the 10%. It's all then at that point in danger. And that's what the enemy is trying to do. That's how we open a door. That's how we're deceived. And now we wonder why God isn't playing nice, why he isn't getting involved, but it's because we haven't done the word of God to get our finances under his protection. Greed is the trigger to trust in me more than him. This takes us to the next one. It's called unbelief. And I want to start this with a scripture out of Proverbs. It says, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord with reverent awe and obedience. This is the part that we were just talking about. This isn't necessarily a prayer first. This is obedience first and agreement in prayer. So do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord with reverent awe and obedience and turn entirely away from evil. I think there's a lot happening in a short amount of time in this scripture. Because I think what, what the, the Lord is trying to show us here is that your eyes can make you wander because you start trusting yourself or you start trusting something other than God. And then what happens is you open yourself up to the consequences of evil. That's what's happening in this scripture. And, and I wonder, is it just as simple as there's two systems that we get to choose between? There's a worldly system and there's a godly system. And if we stay in that word, God just wants us to stay in his system so that he can continue to protect, so that he can continue to control, steer, push the enemy out of our lives in every way. But we get to make the choice, obey the worldly system or obey the godly system. You see, unbelief Unbelief is when we trust things outside of God's system. It's as simple as that. If we're trusting something that God hasn't said, we might be trusting the wrong system. Watch, it maybe an example of marriage. So if you were to look throughout our culture, you were to look on social media, the influencers out there, you were to look online, you were to look anywhere that your eyes go out there in our culture, there is hardly anyone in our culture that believes in the covenant of marriage like the Bible defines. Is that true? So you turn on your TV, there's hardly anything that you see that agrees with the covenant of marriage like the Bible defines, which is pretty dangerous. But the more that it flashes in front of your eyes, the more that you see it, the more you tend to agree with the worldly system instead of a godly system. What does that do? That triggers you to trust the worldly system rather than 
God's system because he designed something that can be pure and whole and be better and better every year from here forward. You see, the enemy does this on everything that comes out of that word so that he can trigger you to trust the system that's not God's. You're going to see premarital sex all over the place. You're going to see uh, same-sex marriage all over the place. Just trust me, neither of those are God's plan. And if you go that route, you've removed yourself from his protective covering and you've trusted a worldly system rather than a godly system. This is the way that it works, okay? This isn't just finances. This is marriage. This is so many things. So you can't believe, you can't believe what you see and believe God at the same time. Because our culture surrounds us every time we walk out the door. Is that true? So you can't believe what you see and believe God at the same time. He's very specific here. In Mark, it says, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, male and female, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. I love that scripture. Because when you come into covenant, you're coming into covenant, a male and a female and God. Three in covenant, and now God says, let no one be able to tear this apart because I'm involved. You see, he's put the protection around it at this point. This is his word, and this is what he wants us to do. But our culture says, no, desire brings us together. No, God wants to bring us together. God wants to be a part of our relationships. God wants to be a part of everything. Marriage is a legal contract. This is true, but it's bigger than that. It's actually a spiritual covenant between a male, a female, and God at that moment. That's what God wants to do. Get me involved early, and we can make this thing work really, really good for you. You're going to be really happy if you're over here in God's system. Then he gives us Ephesians 5, and if you've ever read Ephesians 5, it lines up the female responsibilities in the relationship and the male's responsibilities in the relationship. Another thing that this culture just hates, can't stand it. Oh, if you talk Ephesians 5, you're going to get attacked out there in this culture. But divorce rates have been going up since I was young. But now there's a different thing happening. Now marriage rates are going down because who needs it? This is what our culture says. Who needs it? Why would you do that? That's crazy. That's old-fashioned. That doesn't work. But here's what I'm telling you. Unbelief in God's system, unbelief creates havoc in our lives. We as believers need to step under his covenant, under his protection, under his plan and his system, and then we won't be triggered over here into trusting a worldly system more than God because there's danger in it. And then the last one, the third trigger Fear. And let me, let me describe it like this. I think fear is actually a result of greed and unbelief. Greed and unbelief create fear, and I'll explain it. Greed and unbelief remove you from the protective covering of God and create fear. What I mean by that is God's never moved his protection from you. But when you veer off course and get under the worldly system rather than the godly system, you walk outside of his protective covering. You see that? God's never moved his protective covering from his covenant, which is called the Bible. But what we do is when we get off track from that Bible, off track from that covenant, we remove ourselves from his protection. That's the way it works. Let me give you an example. When, um, when you're running into a snag in your finances and you have not done your finances in a godly fashion, in the godly system, What happens is you tend not to turn to God because you're afraid that you didn't operate in his system anyway and you forget that he's always got the shortest way back for your benefit. You forget that because now you're in fear. Well, God's not going to participate in this because I've never gotten him involved in this. So what do you do? You start to handle it on your own. All those stresses, all those anxieties pile up on top of you. What does that create? The result is fear. Like, we're, we're not to walk around in fear, but it happens when we're in the worldly system rather than the godly system. What happens in marriage, as an example, if you're running into a snag in your relationship, but you haven't done your relationship in a godly 
fashioned. What our mind tells us, what we're tricked into believing, what we're triggered to trust is, well, I didn't do it God's way, so he doesn't want to participate in making this better. So we tend not to go to him because we're either fearful of him in the wrong way, or we're just anxious and nervous and stressed, so we try and handle it all in our own way. We don't turn to him because we never have before. We never trained ourselves to turn into God, so we turn back into that worldly system and think it's going to work, and our relationships just get messy. This is what happens. This is, it, it's as simple as two different systems that we get to choose from. But if we don't know that word of God, if we don't know what his promises are in his word, we're going to end up really, really messy in our life. But I got way better news than all of this. God loves you to such an extent that he's created a way no matter where you find yourself. Watch this, what he says about fear. He says, 1 John 4.18, he says, perfect love drives out fear. What happens when you're in the worldly system, though, is you don't turn to perfect love because you're afraid that you haven't involved him before and he doesn't want to be involved. Now you start feeling really bad about yourself. You start looking at yourself in the mirror. Well, I'm not good enough for God to get involved. Then we don't run to perfect love, so fear stays. God made a way, no matter what spot you're in, no matter how devastating the, the results or the consequences of your decisions have been, no matter how bad your decisions have been, God created a way for you. And you can have it at any moment. What, you, you probably remember this in John 3, 16. He says, for God so loved the world. That's all of us, no matter where we came from, no matter what we've done, no matter how ugly this week has looked, no matter how ugly the last, the last month has looked, God, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Why did he do that? So that you could know no matter what spot you're in in life, no matter how bad of decisions you've made, he loves you more than those bad decisions. He's open to you coming back. To, he's got a way for you where there was no way. If you just step back into his covenant, step back into his system, he's got a way for you. You don't have to be afraid anymore. You can turn to God no matter how bad you've destroyed it. Guess what? You get under his protective covering, he rebukes the devourer once again. Come on. Like he, he's going he's gonna to get behind you. He's going he's gonna to help you. But you may be in this room. You may be online. You may be in the south location. And you're thinking, but I've been walking in fear for so, so long. I'm just afraid. I don't know what to do. And God's got a great scripture for us to look at. It'll be our last scripture that we look at today. But it's his simple way to get us back under his covering. He's made a way for you. No matter how bad it looks, no matter how destroyed the situation is, if you can get it to God, he can heal it. I want to call a leader at the South location to the stage there to help me close out this service. And I want to ask you this. If you're in this room, maybe it's your finances, maybe it's your marriage, maybe it's something completely different than we even talked about today. Maybe it's unforgiveness that's keeping you in fear. Maybe it's hate. Maybe it's anger. Maybe whatever it is today, God's trying to get a hold of your heart today. And I got to show you this scripture because this is his way to turn back into his system. And it's really, really simple. It's available at any moment for you to turn into God's system. Watch this. It says in Acts, repent then and turn to God at any moment no matter what you're going through, no matter what it looks like, no matter how bad the decision's been, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. That times of refreshing, this is God's heart for you, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Does he say, well, you really screwed this up. I'm not sure that I can pull you out of this one. No. He says, just get it back under my covering as fast as you can. This word repent doesn't just mean, I'm sorry. No, it means, God, I, I'm gonna do this different next time. I'm gonna turn in a different direction. That's what this repent means. This isn't just apologize. This isn't just apologize and do it your own way still. No, no, no. You'll stay outside of his protection, outside of his comfort. And what he's calling you to do today is get everything in your life. Just repent and turn from those ways. If you've seen it today in this message, then what he's calling you to do is just give it to him, turn, walk in his direction, and he's going to protect you because now 
he's in control. Would you bow your heads with me today just for a moment? I want to ask you this question. If that's you and you feel like you feel like this has been a season that you've really been under a different system than God's system. Maybe it's been your whole life. You've never introduced Jesus to your life. You've never invited him into your life. I want to ask you if that's you and you've never invited Jesus into your life. I want to ask you to take a bold step of faith today and raise your hand in this room. If that's you, you've never invited Jesus into your life. Anybody? I see that hand. Awesome. Anybody else? This is the moment right here. This is the moment that God wants to get involved to get you back under his protection. If you've never invited Jesus into your life, Awesome. You can put those hands right back down. I want to ask a second group of people. Maybe you've met Jesus. You've invited him into your life. But there's been a snag. There's been an issue. And you feel like you're outside of his protection. And you want to do that one word that God's asked you to do today. And that's repent and turn in to him. You want to recommit your life to Jesus today. I'm going to ask you if you're here. Would you raise your hand in this place? Awesome. Great. So proud of you. Great. Great. Anybody else? This is just between you and God. Nobody's looking around. Just a moment between you and the Father. Awesome. You can put those hands right back down. I want to say this prayer. All of us together, you can repeat it after me, and then I'll pray over that second group of people that are recommitting their lives to Jesus. Repeat this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I repent. I've turned from my ways and into your ways. Today, I'm accepting you as my personal Lord and Savior. I believe that you died on the cross and rose from the dead for my sins. And today, I am saved. In Jesus' name. Amen. God, I pray over that second group of people that are recommitting their lives to you today. God, I thank you and praise you for their day of freedom, which is right now, right in this moment, God. I thank you that as they as they step under your covering once again, God, I believe that you're even changing things in their life right now. I believe that things in front of them are better than they've ever been. I believe that there's miracles in front of them. Even this very week, God, that we're going to hear the testimony of the miracles that you did in their life because they got back under that protection, that control of you, God. We love you and we thank you and we believe it and we receive it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Well, can we give God some praise today?